So our little community here in Holy Family, uh, they play different games at times. Uh, sometimes when the weather's good, we can play games like uh, outside, like a bit of football or frisbee or something like that. Uh, and then in the evenings, um, it's also important that we have kind of community games where people can come together and do things that are relatively harmless. Uh, so there's a, a game which I've seen them play known as uh, two, 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 truths, two Truths and a Lie. Right, Two Truths and a Lie. Very interesting game, very interesting what it reveals about people. Because um, a person, obviously, you have to, each person has to say two truths and a lie about themselves, and people have to guess which one is the lie, right? So, for example, um, I had a piercing, I crashed a car, and I was on a game show, right? And then people have to guess which one, of the, which one of these things is the lie, right? That's, that's the game. Very, it's very interesting what it reveals about people, uh, the, the secrets that people have, the, the hidden things about people, the things that we didn't know, and obviously the things that predate they're coming here to Holy Family. So maybe a life that might have been somewhat maybe more reckless before they got here. So at times it can be very, very interesting. But I was thinking about that today, how in today's gospel, we see something revealed, a secret revealed that the world didn't see and the world didn't know. Jesus lived his life for 30 years in a very hidden way. He was probably, I'd say, I'd say, just like all of the Holy Family, St. Joseph as well, I'd say they were, they were considered like good people, pleasant people to be around, nice people, you know, honest folk. But did people know that Jesus was God? Very unlikely, very unlikely. Did people know that Our Lady was immaculately conceived and so on, that she would be eventually the Queen of Heaven? No, no. So there's this profound secret uh, that they carry in their hearts. And they're not, they're not being uh, mean by, by not sharing it with the word, world. It's just the time hasn't come yet. So there's this wonderful secret that they, that, that they carry in their hearts. But when the time is right, when God's providence ordains it, that secret can be revealed. So Jesus is working for 30 years with St. Joseph and building furniture or uh, structures for houses or who knows what, fixing carts or uh, troughs, different things like that, for 30 years. And you'd imagine, like, why on earth wouldn't God have had him do more good, God the Father? Why wouldn't God the Father have had him do more good right from the beginning, you know? But this, this, this growth in the silence is so important. This... It's, it's important as an example for us that each of us carries, if you will, a, a secret life. There's, a, there's an interior life here which the world doesn't see. There are interior truths, there are interior uh, graces, virtues, there are also interior vices, all these things that we carry in our hearts. There's a whole universe inside here that people don't see. Some of it's good, some of it isn't. Uh, but it's all inside here, and it's all real, and God sees it all. So all of this, while it may be hidden from the world, God sees it. So, so what God sees in a person can be completely different to what we see. God sees a, a, a whole... It's, it's like he sees through different lens altogether. Just, he, he, he sees the virtue that we're striving for. He also sees the, the vice that's present. He doesn't see what the world sees. He doesn't hear the world's applause. He sees the heart. And so Jesus' hidden life for 30 years, a year of prayer, a year of service, a, a, a year that was, sorry, 30 years, a period that was quite ordinary, just ordinary. And so the reason I think that's, that, that, the Lord, that, that God the Father ordained it this way is for each one of us. Most of our lives are relatively ordinary. There's nothing spectacular about them. Uh, we go about our business, you go to your work, you bring home the bread to the family and spend a bit of time with them, eat a few meals. It's, you know, our, most of our lives are just fairly ordinary. And yet that's exactly what and where God wants us to be sanctified. God wants us to sanctify 
in the ordinary life, the ordinary aspects of our day, as he himself did. And then the time will come, like for the Lord, when this interior life will actually be revealed. Kind of a, a startling thought, kind of a scary thought, that this interior life that you have one day will be revealed. So then what, what will be seen by God isn't so much what, all, what the world has seen, but what we have hidden. Our secrets will be revealed. So what are your secrets? What are your deepest secrets? What would you say you're hiding? Because from God there, there is no hiding. God sees the deepest motivations of our hearts, the deepest reasons that we act, the deepest uh, fears, the deepest joys. He sees it all. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a lady who was close to the end of her life. Um, this was something that we meditated during the, the week as well. Uh, we meditated the fact that one, one dies as one has lived, you know. We end our lives as generally as we have lived our lives. And so this lady, um, she was, she would have been a regular mass attender, but there would have been serious problems in the family, problems of disunity, problems of disunity, dare I say, that, that she actually caused. You know, she would have actually stirred up trouble. Uh, she'd tell one son or daughter what the other son or daughter had told her and knowing that this is going to cause trouble, like this is, you know, so something was said in confidence and she'd pass it on, it would create division and then these would start fighting and it seems that she almost reveled in it, she'd kind of sit back and smile and say, oh look at them, look at them all fighting now. Very, very strange, very, very odd behaviour and yet this lady was, was quite convinced that that everyone goes to heaven, that everyone goes straight up, you know, and that she hadn't killed anyone, so uh, she was going straight up herself. Now, I'm not anyone's judge or jury, it's not my job, but I did have a concern. Like, if you have had the opportunity to do good and to create unity and to create healing, to create peace, and if you have maybe even the responsibility as a parent to, to try and unite your family, to unite your children, if you fall short of that, like you are answerable to God. You know, these, these, these secret things. And then what is the motivation? What is the secret that you're carrying in your heart? Why, why do you want there to be disunity within your family? Why do we do these things? All of this will be revealed. Not just what people see. What people see on the outside is, you know, a relatively harmless looking person who goes to mass. It all looks fine. But the interior life can be completely different. Completely different. God doesn't see what people see. God sees the heart. And our secrets will be revealed. So I think when we think of sanctity, when we think of, of, uh, of holiness, especially us Irish, like we, we focus very much on the exterior things. You know, we see a person who goes to, to Mass regularly or back in the day when we could go to daily Mass and people would say, oh, Janie, they're shock and holy go to Mass every day. And maybe even we ourselves think, well, Jenny, I go to Mass every day, so I'm shocking holy, you know. As if it's that easy, you know. It's not that easy at all. It's not about just, I mean, please, if, you, if, if we can, when this oh, whole virus thing passes and we can go back to Mass daily, please do. But sanctity isn't contained therein, you know. There, there's more to living a holy life than, than just going to Mass. We have to live in that presence of the Eucharist out there. We have to bring the presence of Jesus out there into the world. The day will come when, when the veil is lifted and our, our secrets are revealed. So does that thought scare you? If it doesn't, maybe you're on the right track. If it does, what exactly are you scared of? If you're afraid of your secrets being revealed, why are there secrets that you don't want revealed? I think our sanctity is judged more on what we do behind closed doors than on what we do in a chapel. Oh, it's very hard, it's kind of, well, I was going to say it's hard to sin in a chapel. You can still sin in a chapel by just, you know, thinking thoughts of hatred or violence or whatever it may be, or revenge or jealousy. Oh, look at your one there now with the Shnazi handbag, who does she think she is? Like, I mean, it's, you, can still, you can still sin in a chapel, absolutely. Um, but it's easier not to sin in here. I think 
the, the judgment that, that we will experience or what will be revealed is more what happens behind closed doors at home. That's more what we're judged on because it's, it's easy to be holy here. So what are those secrets? And if there are secrets, maybe now is a good time to start unveiling them, start healing them, start changing them so that we don't have anything to hide. Another word for that is conversion. If there's something in our lives that needs to be changed, if there's something in our lives that we don't want broadcast to the world, if there's some kind of a dark, hidden secret that we don't want people to know, well, then that's what we need to change. If there's some area of our lives that, that, that's, you know, kind of a, a hidden sin that I'm, I'm able to kind of keep from people, so people think I'm still doing great and I can still kind of have my backup sin that no one knows about, if there's something there that that's being hidden, that I'm, I'm hiding from others or think I'm hiding from God, then that's what needs to be worked on. If there's something I don't want broadcast to the world, that's what I need to change. In seminary as well, it's just very interesting how uh, remember there was, you come across very different characters and they're from different walks of life in different countries, and different languages and, and, and that. But there was this one guy and uh, he used to spend an awful long time in the chapel and it was actually kind of inspirational to me because he, he just he'd spend he'd spend hours there he'd spend an awful lot of his free time in there and he was in the community before me for what maybe three or four years before I got there so when I when I arrived as a young seminarian I saw this chap oh was in the chapel I thought oh that's 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 fantastic well done maybe I should do that so and then after Three years, I think, when I, was in, when I was in seminary, after about three years, he decided that he was going to leave. And it shocked me. I thought, if, if he's going to leave, then what on earth? I mean, um, do, do I stand a chance? Like, I mean, because he, so, he was just in the chapel so much, you know? I mean, just a, a, such a good example. So I was talking to, to Father Paul, afterwards my, my spiritual director, and I said, Father Paul, I'm just really surprised about this, this chap leaving. I said, it's just a bit, it's kind of after, after shocking me a bit. And he said, he said, don't worry. When you're in the chapel, pray. Unite your heart to the Lord. You have nothing to worry about. He said, there's a difference between being in the chapel and thinking of your own thoughts over and over and over again. And so, while you're sitting in the chapel, you're not actually praying. You're just thinking and rethinking and overthinking and thinking, replaying your day and replaying all of the hurts and the wounds that you have received and just replaying and replaying. That's not prayer. Now, that can happen in a living room, can happen in your bedroom, can happen in the chapel, but it's not prayer. He said, this chap would have had a kind of an issue with just sitting in the chapel for hours and just thinking and kind of working himself into almost a, a, a depression. So it was just an interesting example like of the, the interior life. Interior life. This is what the Lord sees. These are the secrets that will be revealed. And this fundamentally is, is it's who we are. The, the facade that we present, that's, that's not really who we are. What the Lord sees, what's in here, that's who we are. So is this ready? Is, is this interior life of mine, is this ready to meet the Lord? Is this ready to be broadcast? And if not... We have a new year now, new year, new me and all of that. If there's something that needs to be changed, let's start changing it. If there's a relationship that needs to be healed, let's start healing it. If I need to pray more, let's, let's start praying more. If I need to forgive, then let's start a process of forgiveness. If I need to overcome a vice of, of impurity or addiction or... Whatever it is, well then let's start. Let's start. Let's not wait until I think I'm near the end to start working on these things because we don't know when the end is. My prayer for each one of us is that when the end of our life comes and we stand before the Lord, imagine what it would be like to hear from our Heavenly Father who we have lived to please, who we've lived on this world to come to know ever more deeply. That when we stand before him, then he looks at us and he says, you are my son, my daughter, the beloved. My favor rests on you.